Okay, so let us let us make a start. So we have um, plenty of time for our our speakers today. So well, welcome and good afternoon, everybody, to this um, first um, Bristol Composite Institute uh, Composite Perspective series of lectures. Or perhaps it's uh, good morning if you are. Um, further west from us now or or maybe good evening um, uh, for those of you uh, in the east so this uh, composites perspective um, series of lectures that that uh, we've set up um, and michael wisdom initiated uh, aims to bring together speakers from both industry and academia with a particular aim of showing how there's applications end of things um, together with the, the low TRL uh, research that we do in universities can come together on some of the, the really big challenges for, for the composite sector. So today we will be uh, hearing from uh, two distinguished speakers, uh, Richard Oldfield and Pascal Hubert, whose uh, talks I will uh, introduce individually in a minute. Um, and they'll be talking uh, on the, the topic of sustainable composites. So our first speaker is Richard Oldfield, who joined the UK National Composite Centre as its uh, CEO in 2018, following a period at GKN, where he was uh, technical director and then senior vice president for engineering technology and then advanced metallic technologies. So today, uh, Richard's talk is on Composite's role on delivering net zero. So without further ado, I will pass over to Richard Oldfield. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you just see my screen? Stephen, is that working? Yes, all good. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start by introducing the NCC and what we do. The NCC was set up 10 years ago and is the UK's National Centre of Excellence for Composite Innovation. We sit as part of the UK's network of innovation centres called the Catapults and are a standalone subsidiary of the University of Bristol and as such work really closely with the Bristol Composites Institute. The Catapults were established in 2012 to bridge the so-called valley of death between academic research and industrial application with our sole aim being translating research into impact and helping companies with their innovation challenges. We do this across a wide range of manufacturing technology areas, but our particular focus is on composites. And over the last 10 years, we've established significant specialist capabilities and now rank as one of Europe's leading composite innovation capabilities with over 700 engineers between the NCC and BCI and around 200 million pounds worth of equipment. But today, the, the focus of the talk will be on the role composites have in delivering net zero. I'm going to address many of the opportunities, but also discuss the critical enablers and challenges that must be solved. But I thought I'd start by saying that the future demand for composites is high. There have been various market forecasts done recently, and they all conclude that composites are due to grow much faster than the global economy, at anywhere between 6 to 9% per annum for at least the next decade. And you might have noticed recently that the US government also designated composites as a critical technology given its future importance to many sectors. And one of the reasons for this is the role composites are likely to play in delivering net zero. And as you can see from the analysis in the blue table on the right, the source of approximately three quarters of global emissions would benefit from the use of composite technologies, delivering everything from lightweighting to enable electrification, to high temperature lightweight materials to unlock nuclear and everything in between. However, to achieve this, it relies on solving four key challenges, which is the focus of the talk today. Firstly, bringing new products to market more quickly. The timescales for delivering net zero are so short, development cycles will need to be compressed, lengthy validation timescales collapsed, and regulations evolved much more rapidly. Secondly, current and new products have sustainable solutions. This is a big challenge for composite materials where their key benefits are also their biggest weaknesses. New materials and processes will need to be engineered to come up with more sustainable solutions for the future. And thirdly, new supply chains for these materials, products and processes will need to be established. And all of this with a keen eye on the full life cycle effects and the embodied emissions footprint 
of all of these new products and processes. So where are composites used today and where are they likely to be used in the future? The main conclusion from this slide is that composites grow strongly across the board and link directly to the previous global emissions table with a critical role to play in decarbonizing future transportation, helping reduce the carbon footprint of the built environment and delivering the energy transition, including a key role in establishing the future hydrogen economy. So let's focus first on the largest sector, the so-called the so -called fourth generation of aerospace. Aerospace is due to recover to pre-pandemic levels around 2025, with future demand for aircraft remaining strong, driven by continued increases in the number of people flying in the emerging markets of Asia and Africa, the replacement of the aging fleet in Europe and the US, and new markets opening up for urban air mobility. And to minimise the environmental effect of this growth, a combination of alternative fuel, propulsion, new aircraft solutions are needed. All of these are enabled by composites. Compounding this, the use is that the largest future market is projected to be for single aisle short to mid-range aircraft, which are today predominantly metallic. So when these aircraft are redesigned over the next 20 years or so, and replaced with a higher percentage of composite structures, the usage will dramatically increase. Coupled with this is the overall is the opportunity pre presented by hydrogen powered flight. There have been many recent studies evaluating how aviation can reduce its carbon emissions and the reality is it'll have to be a combination of solutions. Sustainable aviation fuels will be required in the short to medium term and in the longer term for long range flight. Electric propulsion will be used for very short range missions and with hydrogen targeted for the high volume short to mid range segment. Recent studies through the UK Fly Zero initiative and the EU's Clean Sky programme have concluded that hydrogen, either through direct combustion or through fuel cells, offers the highest potential to minimise aviation's carbon emissions. However, this requires major changes to conventional aircraft concepts, aircraft infrastructure and the global energy supply system for this to be realised. All good news for composites. If we look at the tr surface transport sector, the story is similar, where the roadmap to decarbonise is clearly defined. In the next decade, petrol and diesel cars will be a thing of the past and a range of new mobility solutions will be in place. The move to electric cars is well underway with clear government targets and new products being brought to market almost every week. Composites are increasingly being used to lightweight solutions to offset the weight of batteries and to increase the range and performance of vehicles. Longer range and heavier vehicles are increasingly considering hydrogen solutions, the hydrogen bus, train, trucks and off-highway vehicles already in service. All of these require hydrogen storage. And you can see from the slide that the current solutions are far from optimum today with real potential to reduce weight costs and increase the operating envelope. In addition, solutions must be found to create fully sustainable solutions as it will not be acceptable to simply dispose of this material at the end of its life. It's analogous to the battery mountain challenge facing electrification. Working with BM Longworth and Signet TechSkim, the, the NCC recently demonstrated the first step in this journey by successfully reclaiming fibres from existing tanks and then using them to make a new pressure vessel. Whilst there's a long way to go from this first step to a fully validated and cost-effective process, it shows the potential to develop solutions of this nature. But perhaps the most significant opportunity for composites to impact the delivery of net zero comes in supporting the energy transition. It's well documented that the energy mix will change over the coming generation with far less reliance on oil and gas and significantly increased amounts of wind, nuclear, solar and hydrogen power. Composites have a key role to play in delivering these energy transitions. I'll talk more about wind in a minute, but the other sectors are seeing an increasing use of composites as well. Despite the growth in renewable energy, oil and gas will still have a role to play and there are numerous opportunities to optimise subsea structures and pipelines that will make the industry more efficient into the future. We've already talked about the demand for hydrogen, but this will need generating, distributing and storing. The slide highlights the potential of offshore generation of hydrogen and the associated composite infrastructure that would be needed to enable this. Closely linked to this is the need for significant carbon capture and storage if the UK and other countries are to meet their net zero goals. This again needs new composite solutions and updated regulations to be developed. Focusing back on wind is the largest growth opportunity to enable net zero electrification and the production of green hydrogen. 
The UK currently has the world's largest fleet of offshore turbines with an installed capacity of over 10 gigawatts, supplying about 30% of our electricity. The government has increased has committed to increase this fourfold by 2030 and sevenfold by 2050. This growth is even higher on a global perspective as the graph in the top right shows. This is urgently needed as it coincides with an anticipated surge in the demand to power electric vehicles, heat domestic homes, and to produce large quantities of green hydrogen. Offshore turbines are nearly a quarter of a kilometer in diameter and set to get bigger and deployed further from shore on floating platforms that open up access to much more of the coastline and higher quality wind locations. The NCC in partnership with the Department for Business and the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult are leading what's called the Dual Challenge, which is a study into the next generation of enormous floating offshore turbines that address cost, embedded carbon and sustainability challenges. Finally, I want to talk about construction infrastructure. The global construction sector is currently one of the biggest emitters of carbon responsible for about 40% of all emissions. The sector is projected to grow dramatically over the next decade with global forecasts estimating an 85% increase in output and therefore emissions unless something is done. The UK government has set out ambitious targets to transform this critical sector with dramatic reductions in cost, lead times and emissions. This can only be achieved with different solutions and has the potential to be the largest market for composites in the future and provide huge net zero benefits, such as increasing building efficiency, reducing the use of raw materials, the increased use of sustainable materials, increasing life and durability and many more, as you can see from the slide. And because this sector is relatively underexploited today with less than 10% of the current composite market, it provides huge potential if the future barriers to entry can be overcome. And just to give three small examples of where the NCC is working on solutions in this sector. The first is efficient modular construction solutions incorporating factory based production and new materials. The second is future infrastructure, new concepts that can lower carbon footprint, reduce costs and extend life. And the third is low carbon concrete looking at alternative materials to reduce the carbon footprint. And this is only the tip of the iceberg of the opportunities that exist. However, all of these fantastic opportunities to use composites to develop products for the future that will enable net zero to be realized all rely on solving the other three challenges. Addressing composite material sustainability, ensuring new supply chains are developed and reducing the embodied emissions. Addressing the sustainability issue first, I don't need to tell you that the greatest strength of composite materials is also their biggest challenge, as they're predominantly derived from oil and very difficult to recycle. Cracking this challenge will be the single biggest enabler to the role composites play in future product development. And as you can see from the slide, this is a common challenge faced across many sectors with large amounts of composite waste generated over the next generation as the use of composites rises and products reach the end of their operational life. Not pretending this is an easy task to fix, but it needs to be addressed or else the operational benefits of the use of composites in many applications will not be able to be realized. I know that further talks are gonna talk more about this, but as you know, there are already a number of existing technologies that can be used and many more in various stages of development, but this will need rapid development of the materials and processes into cost and environmentally effective op options alongside policy and regulation to drive change. Just to highlight a couple of areas where the NCC is involved. The first is the Sustainable Composites Partnership with CPI, one of the other catapult centers. And the second is the ICAST consortium led by the University of Bath. Both of these are looking to tackle various different parts of the problem across aspects of the material and product life cycle shown by the infinity diagram. The holy grail being to identify truly circular opportunities. Although initially there are many opportunities for improvement, even if the full cycle options are not yet fully feasible. One of the other key levers is the benefits of working across multiple sectors. One sector's waste is, another, is another's feed material, and it's only by considering a total systems approach that many of these challenges can be addressed. Just to look in more detail at the wind turbine example, today blades that reach the end of their lives are placed in landfill. However, this is beginning to change with bans already announced in four European countries, with calls from Wind Europe for a Europe-wide ban by 2025. The graph on the top right shows that we're only in the foothills of this problem, 
with the first generations of blades only just coming out of service. This expands over the next 30 years and the University of Cambridge have estimated 43 million tonnes of waste will have been created by wind turbines by 2050. Many organisations are committed to addressing this problem and the NCC is contributing and leading a consortium called SUSWIND to explore and develop the solutions for current and future blades. This leads directly into the next challenge and the need to develop future supply chains for the whole value chain. The first issue is the availability of carbon fibre, where JEC forecasts a shortage over the coming decade unless the supply chain is expanded. It's critical that this expansion is in a low carbon system to minimise the environmental impact of the expansion. Locating this close to use to, minim to minimise transportation emissions is also a key consideration. This leads to an opportunity to reshore manufacturing or greenshore, as it's being termed, and more to come on this later. Picking another example, if the use of hydrogen expands as is forecast, then the demand for carbon fibre for tanks increases as the graph shows. The rest of the supply chain would also have to follow with tank producers, equipment suppliers, test facilities, etc., etc., all seeing dramatic increases. This also provides a huge need for future recycling supply chains. This is a current map of the composite recycling capabilities and the level of technical maturity represented by the TRL scale on the right, and you can see there are many gaps. You can see from the chart in the bottom right that for mature processes, there is no UK supply chain, and for emerging technologies, there is still work to do. All of this would need to be dramatically scaled up as the requirement increases and new technology solutions are developed. This is a particular gap and opportunity in the UK, but also in other countries to develop future supply chain solutions with companies now starting to develop capabilities in this sector. But throughout all of this, we must consider the total embodied emissions and look to optimize the whole of the value chain from a net zero perspective. It's not only through the improved operation of products, benefiting from the use of composites, but how we recycle and reuse them, but also through optimizing the total embodied emissions through the development and manufacturing processes. These graphs show the UK consumes more emissions than it produces, i.e. it's a net importer of emissions. However, these are rarely accounted for, which you can see on the chart on the right, which shows UK manufacturing emissions have declined over the last 30 years, but overall manufacturing emissions have remained relatively flat, implying that the improvements have been mainly achieved by offshoring manufacturing. It's in fact estimated that roughly 90% of the UK's emissions associated from manufacturing products come from outside of the UK. This is even worse if the new location has worse manufacturing emissions than the UK, with higher carbon energy supply from coal powered fire stations and less efficient manufacturing processes. To explore this a bit further, it's worth investigating where these emissions come from in the product development chain. This model and analysis was performed by the University of Leeds, and I've just picked the example for aerospace, although many more have been evaluated. When, what the analysis shows is that approximately 80% of aerospace manufacturing emissions are generated in the raw material and materials processing. And it's only by addressing this part of the value chain that large savings can be made. Interestingly, for the aerospace sector in the UK, much of this value chain is imported, with the UK aerospace manufacturing content primarily being positioned in the subcomponent system and assembly stages. The real opportunity is to reshore this manufacturing to the UK, eliminating the emissions from transporting the product in the first place and relocating it to a lower carbon energy supply with improved manufacturing processes. As I mentioned earlier, this phenomenon is called greenshoring and is a real opportunity for future competitiveness and attracting supply chains of the future. If we now look more closely at composite material production, the opportunity is dramatic. Not only is the fundamental raw material oil-based, but there are huge amounts of electricity that are used in the material manufacturing process, particularly in the oxidization stage. This puts carbon fiber as one of the highest contributors of direct emissions per kilogram of material produced. So the opportunity is to address both. More efficient manufacturing processes for carbon fiber, and maximising the amount of renewable energy that's used in the production. The graph on the right shows the scale of the opportunity. The European Composites Industry Association shows that versus an average European energy mix, it's significantly worse to manufacture carbon fibre in other regions that use less renewable energy. 
It also shows a significant opportunity to use the UK's future energy mix to reduce carbon emissions from reshoring carbon fibre production. Coupling this with more efficient manufacturing processes, particularly for oxidisation, and local manufacturing to eliminate transportation emissions could lead to dramatic reductions in the emissions from carbon fibre production. This offers an attractive opportunity to greenshore manufacturing content, couple it with re uh, recycling supply chains and deliver a low carbon manufacturing economy for the future. So in summary, the future market opportunity for composites is very strong and there is a real opportunity for composites to play a key role in delivering net zero across many sectors. But it relies on solving the four major challenges that I've outlined. Getting products to market more quickly, solving the sustainability of composite materials, developing the supply chains that are needed to deliver, and reducing the total embodied emissions. I hope that gives you plenty of food for thought, and I look forward to taking questions. Thank you, Richard. So can I remind everybody to please put any questions in the Q&A and not use the chat? So we have a, a first question there um, from Shmuel Yerushalmi, um, who asks, um, how according to you, massive use in composites can support resolution, hard social and economic problems and reducing social disparities in the society? Sorry, Stephen, you broke up slightly. Could you just repeat that? How, according to you, can massive use in composites support the resolution to hard social and economic problems and reduce social disparities in society? Uh, a very broad question, but uh, I don't know if yeah. you've got answers to. Yeah, I suppose, I suppose, I mean, I'm not sure I've got an answer to such a wide ranging question, other than the fact that composites touch so many parts of the economy and therefore so many sectors across the complete value chain. And I think this offers significant opportunities in so many locations, so many sectors, so many regions, that the opportunity that composites can play contributing to net zero, but also offering significant opportunities socially and economically for the development of regions, economies, et cetera, that I think that's, that's where the real benefit lies. So I think it's the breadth of opportunities that, that are there that is probably the answer to the question. Okay, thank you. So another, um, perhaps a slightly more straightforward question to, to answer this time um, from uh, an anonymous attendee. It, can you clarify uh, consuming emissions and producing emissions? Yeah, so, so consuming emissions is the total emissions associated for, from the products that you use, whereas producing emissions are only the ones that are generated within your within your region or within your your country so that means that the total emissions are is everything associated with the products that we consume in this case in the uk but for all countries versus or compared against the actual number of emissions that are, are created by the production in the country and what you can see from what i presented for the uk we're a significant net importer of emissions okay thank you um, and then another uh, anonymous question. In the construction sector, it seems composites is not mainstream material yet. Do you reckon it has good opportunities in the construction sector and how? Yes, I think it's the biggest opportunity from a, from a scale perspective that, that, that composites can play. And it's on many, on many levels. And the chart showed listed all sorts of areas where composites can play. But, but probably more significantly, not only in the, the operational performance of buildings and infrastructure, but also in the use of sustainable materials and the ability for it to be part of that infinity diagram that I put up that shows that actually construction infrastructure is that there's a huge opportunity for, the, for construction infrastructure to play a very significant role using materials that have, reusing materials that have been used in other sectors. So I think there is a huge opportunity. Um, it's expanding in different parts of the world at different rates, but I think huge opportunity. Uh, and with the growth that's coming, I think it's um, a yeah, massive opportunity. Could you perhaps just expand on that a little bit? Because often we associate composites um, and their sort of role in net zero as lightweighting of transport, but, but in the construction sector, um, 
one doesn't immediately think of lightweight buildings. So, so how how is the uh, are there specific examples that perhaps uh, in terms yeah, I mean, of the, I mean, the construction the weight sector, benefits can can translate yeah. to construction? Yeah, and some of them are indirect, Stephen. So some of them are so more more energy efficient buildings. Um, ex expanding the life of the built infrastructure, which means you use a net less, um, you know, um, materials over their life, um, the ability to use sustainable materials more effectively, the ability um, in the built environment to use materials that have been relifed or reused from other sectors. So there are many, many, many different ways where composites can contribute either directly or indirectly to improving the environmental footprint of the built environment. And I think it's, and whilst some of the benefits might be indirect, the scale of the opportunity is so high that the overall benefit could easily be higher. Okay, thank you. And there's time for just one last question that I'll go to Naomi, um, who asks, do you reckon there will be a worldwide ban on wind um, blades going into landfill, or is it only certain countries that this will be applicable for? I guess that's heading towards will we be offshoring at some of our, our um, waste that we, we, we can't uh, recycle in the future perhaps? I suppose the indirect answer to the question, and it's really the challenge that I'm posing through this talk, is unless we solve those four problems, you will see over time regulations expanding and being increased. It will clearly be led by different uh, parts of the world with different, you know, in different parts of the, uh, with different priorities. But overall, I think we will see use restricted regulation increased unless we can solve some of these problems. Okay, well, I think that's a good note to, to draw things to a close and move on to our second speaker, uh, Professor Pascal Hubert. Thank you, Richard. So, as I said, our second speaker is uh, Pascal Hubert, who is Director of the Research Centre for High Performance Polymer and Composite Systems at McGill University in Canada. Pascal has been at McGill since 2002, when he joined as a much more junior assistant professor, uh, having previously spent time at the NASA Langley Research Centre as well. So today, uh, Pascal's talk will be on solutions for zero waste composite free preg processing. So without further ado, I will pass over to you, Pascal. Thank you very much for the introduction. I hope you can see my presentation and you hear me well. Yes, all good, thank you. Please go ahead. So um, thank you uh, first for, from Richard for introducing uh, very broadly the, the, the big challenge that we have ahead of us. Uh, and my presentation is gonna be uh, focusing really on one particular material system that we, we are very, uh, uh, familiar with is the uh, the autoclave prepreg, which has uh, been used extensively in high performance applications, and 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 a lot uh, of of, uh, of it goes to the aerospace industry as we are making more and more large aircrafts with uh, composites. There is going to be, uh, as is what was shown before, a higher demand for these materials, and the. Uh, the goal really on, on manufacturing a composite is really to, to try to uh, really reduce the, the footprint of that operation and, and make it more sustainable. Um, and there's different ways of, uh, of targets that we're trying to, to uh, tackle this, uh, reducing the amount of energy, of course, uh, reducing the cost of the process and the time of the process, but also the amount of waste that is generated. And today, uh, I, it's fair to say that the composite manufacturing is, is not that sustainable. There's a lot of waste during that process. And if we look at uh, how we make uh, composites with prepreg, I mean, uh, prepregs are often coming in forms of rolls uh, and uh, they are cut out into pieces and they're laid up by hand. Um, it's just really coming straight from what is done in the fashion industry uh, as a lot of the base material is textile. Uh, so there's not been a lot of evolution in that. Um, now more for a couple of decades now, we have a robotic placement, which try to tailor a little bit the uh, placement of the material and, and, and therefore reducing uh, the amount of, uh, 
of, of cuts that we get from these materials. Speaking of waste, in terms of prepregs, uh, they are mainly uh, uh, coming up from uh, off cuts as you cut up from the prepreg roll, but even in uh, automated fiber placement, you could also have a significant amount of waste. And if you talk to various industries, uh, this can uh, go from 10 to 50% of waste uh, for prepreg material. This is really uh, not uh, negligible. So if we look at the material flow uh, with prepreg manufacturing, you start off with uh, the raw material that is often stored uh, in, uh, in, uh, in freezers. They have a certain shelf life. So uh, depending on, uh, on uh, you know, different situation, you might get some rejected material. You might get even some expired material that can no longer be used to make parts. And then during the fabrication process, as I showed, there's quite a lot of offcuts that are generated from the manufacturing. So all of these materials are essentially pristine materials with fibers and resin that haven't been processed. And so they, they are very high value material and uh, we know relatively well their history, uh, their composition. So uh, there, there are opportunities to, to be able to recycle this material at that stage. Once the part is manufactured, obviously, uh, there's first source of rejects in terms of uh, maybe part that are defective. And then we have the service and the end of life waste, which this is another big uh, topic uh, of uh, that we have to develop uh, recycling methods. But for today, I'm going to focus on the prepreg recycling. So if we speak of the different recycling routes, uh, one that we see uh, a lot of applications are the thermochemical or fiber reclamation. So what we do is we basically uh, extract the resin and we keep the fiber. So we keep the high value ma material of the fiber but we therefore uh, disregard the value of the uncured resin. So for prepreg, we, we are essentially wasting a material that it can be still used. Um, this uh, recycling process requires very large infrastructures. So uh, again, the logistic of uh, bringing these materials to the recycling site can increase again the carbon footprint and, and the cost. The other solution is to simply crush uh, the fibers into smaller pieces uh, to, that would essentially degrade their, their value. Uh, they will be used as fillers. So again, maybe losing some of the, 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 the capability and the, the performance of, of these materials. As you have to remember, they are very high performance material to start with. And finally, incineration uh, is only there to capture the energy of the material and we don't can consider that as recycling. So let's say if you uh, wanna take your, your prepreg material and uh, chop it up into little pieces and make a, make a part using compression molding, which is kind of attractive because as these offcuts are have odd shapes, it's quite straightforward to put them into small chips and process them. If you do this directly with the prepreg, uh, you might have a lot of problems and uh, you have often defective parts with very poor quality. And also uh, as these materials have been engineered to be cured in a very long process cycle in autoclaves, uh, you'll have to cure them for a long time. Also, uh, they are hard to handle, they are tacky uh, in their raw form. So it's gonna be very difficult to make these, uh, these materials. So there's something that has to be done to recycle these materials. And if we look at the fundamental cause of uh, these uh, poor qualities, that if you look at the autoclave uh, prepreg, there's been engineers really to flow uh, it by percolation mode as you need low viscosity resin and to completely wet the fibers. As in compression molding, you wanna have a material that flow like shear. And they typically uh, have, you typically have this behavior when your viscosity has a higher, uh, your resin has a higher viscosity. And these process have very short time. So the goal will be to try to, to get the material from an autoclave behavior to a 
compressing uh, shear flow behavior. So if we look at the resin viscosity, it's really a, a good source of make us understand the, the differences in the, the two behaviors. If you look at material systems that are engineered for compression molding, and I'm showing you some examples with thermoplastic resins, you look at their resin viscosities in the range of hundreds and 1000 pascal seconds. While most thermosets are in the low uh, viscosity range, past one pascal second, 10 at the most. Now, if we look at the uh, viscosity as a function of degree of cure and temperature, we can see that with thermosets, we can have a wide range of viscosity. And if we look at the particular range of interest, which is 100 to 1000 pascal second, you see that it is possible to bring the thermal set resin in that range by playing with the uh, initial degree of cure of the, of the resin system. So this is really the rationale for developing uh, the, um, the recycling system that we would like to propose. To better understand uh, the impact of resin viscosity on, on flow, we can do a small one flow, one D flow compassion experiments where we take the prepreg and we place it into a mold and we just excite the flow in one direction. And if we change the initial viscosity of the, of the resin, we see clearly that as we increase the viscosity, the material will flow uh, in different ways. It will, it will deform to different magnitudes. And if we try to track that uh, deformation by measuring uh, the uh, shear flow of the sample, basically by taking uh, a, a picture of the volume fraction of the fibers, and we can see that near the edges of the sample, the, the, uh, the volume fraction will drop. And we can take a threshold of about 20% fiber volume fraction to determine the, the length of the uh, deformed uh, uh, prepreg. We can now plot the uh, shear strain as a function of the resin viscosity. And we see some interesting uh, behaviors that at low resin viscosity, as expected, we get very little shear strain. So the material mostly flow by percolation. But then if we go to higher viscosity range, then we start to see some very significant shear strains, meaning that the material now behaves like a very viscous uh, uh, material. And if we look at a range of 200 to 300 pascal seconds, we see that it's a good compromise between not uh, significantly advancing the material and still having a, a high uh, viscosity high enough to have the right flow mechanism. So this basically set the stage to the proposed recycling framework that we developed, which is to take a, a non-cured prepreg waste. Uh, first inspecting the material and uh, looking at their curing state by doing some very careful material characterization to understand the relationship between viscosity and degree of cure. We can then establish the right staging process that will bring this waste material to a material that we can uh, process in, in uh, compression molding. And that recycled compound, the advantage of it is that now it has an extended out life. Uh, it can be tailored to, uh, to flow and make very complex parts. And it has no tack, which is uh, making the material a lot easier to handle. And finally, it can cure more rapidly. So I'm gonna go through the different uh, stages to, to show you a bit more detail. So the first, the recovery stage, you get material that comes in different shapes. Uh, they can have, as you can see, a very, uh, uh, a very unknown, an unknown outlife or shelf life, but some of them could have been very well documented and we know the history of the material. So first step would be to develop uh, waste inspection techniques. And uh, we've uh, looked at different techniques, uh, differential scanning calorimetry, FTAR, GPC, even measuring the tack of the prepreg. So these are all techniques that would give you 
the uh, the state of the material as it, it, it comes in the process. And they all have different, uh, you know, uh, material need in terms of quantity of material. There's have different characterization times and costs. So there should be a lot of efforts uh, dedicated to further develop these inspection techniques, as this is often a big challenge in, in the recycling industry is to, is to sort out the material and know exactly what kind of material you're dealing with. In terms of material characterization, we, our industry has a very many, many years, a lot of experiences in all kinds of techniques to measure viscosity as a function of degree of cure, glass transition temperature and so on. So this is very important that we do this for to further fully understand uh, uh, the evolution of these properties with different temperature and, and curing conditions. So the staging process is explained here. So again, I'm showing this graph of viscosity as a function of degree of cure. So the incoming material is usually engineered for the autoclave process. So it has a very low viscosity uh, to start with and very low degree of cure. If one would like to uh, process it at a, so that it has a higher viscosity, that would require a very long time to cure because the material uh, is, is not going to be cured at a temperature uh, high enough. So the, really the trick is to move this material into the range of viscosity that is of interest for, for ensuring that you have the right flow mechanism. And that's by staging or advancing or C-staging the material to a higher initial degree of cure. So this is accomplished uh, by essentially uh, subjecting the prepreg to uh, a temperature cycle in an oven or even different type of heating source can be developed, infrared and so on. And once you, you get the right degree of cure, the material can be cooled down rapidly. And at room temperature, then the material will be essentially vitrified and can be easily stranded and that's another problem. If you try to strand pristine composite uh, prepreg, it's a tacky material. You're going to gum up completely the, the stranding uh, machines. But with the staging process, the material can be more easily stranded. Then it's the molding process. So to show a little bit the, what can be achieved, um, I'm showing here two geometries that have complex features a multi-rib panel, a compound T-bracket, where you have <clears throat> these uh, very complex uh, features. In order to help us uh, tailoring the right staging and curing process, uh, again, with the knowledge of the material uh, curing behavior, we can establish these processing maps of cure time and cure temperature. And we can see ISO lines of uh, um, final part glass transition temperature. So if you want, let's say, to cure at 140 C uh, and a cure time of about 45 minutes, we see here that it would require a material that is staged at about 49 with a, with a G of a 49 degrees Celsius. So with that, we can then take the material, stage with the right uh, initial TG or degree of cure, and we can see here that the uh, process is simply of uh, applying pressure and temperature. And then we maintain that, that uh, temperature for uh, the time required to fully cure the pipe. And this is uh, the type of uh, part that you get with very good features, uh, good surface finish. You can make very complex parts. Material really flow well. To demonstrate, if uh, you would try to do this uh, part without staging the material or just taking the prepreg right off the, the rolls of the, the offcuts without just as it was, you would get a very ugly part as the part has not, the material does not have the right uh, capability to, to, to flow. And by staging it, you can see that you achieve very good quality. Now, there's also some, uh, some issue that uh, can occur. For example, uh, the uh, backing film that we have on prepreg, uh, if it's not completely removed, you could have 
again, uh, trap backing film in the system. So with any recycling methodology, there will be impurities. Also uh, for complex parts, you, you have maybe features like knit lines, things like that, which is typical of trying to make uh, net shape parts, but that is true for any, uh, any uh, short fiber uh, composite systems. And that has to be taken into consideration in the design. Now, in terms of uh, material properties, obviously uh, the process is, is gonna, uh, you're not gonna get necessarily the same properties as, as pristine material, but by comparing the uh, properties of this recycled uh, compound with existing uh, discontinuous fiber uh, composite, we see that they are quite comparable. Uh, maybe you see that the tensile strength is a bit is lower, but you have also to look that the fibers have been also cut to a shorter length. So that plays a big role in that, in that properties. We've also looked at the toughness of the material. And again, it maintained this toughness uh, uh, to, to, to a good uh, level. So obviously uh, one would not design necessarily a part that has the same property as the virgin material, but there's still a lot of applications where this compound can be, can be used. So really in, uh, in conclusion, uh, we, we can really propose a, a solution for uh, using these waste material by really targeting uh, the, the right viscosity of the, the resin. Uh, this is with the knowledge of, that we have with these materials. And that can be accomplished without adding any additives to the system. And uh, we see that it's very important to understand the relationship between the, you know, the different parameters that are in, uh, involved in the compression molding process, so such as mold closure rate and viscosity. And there will be variations in the pre-preg degree of cure. Um, and this will have an impact. So it's very important to develop the right inspection techniques to, uh, to really address those variability. And again, as I said, we, we, had, we have uh, material properties that are quite attractive and therefore can, can open the door to, uh, to applications of this uh, material. Now there's some challenges, obviously, as I as said before, there's a wide range of chemistry, material systems and so on. And this is true for any uh, materials. Uh, when you try to recycle them, you have to deal with the mixing of all of these different materials. So there's still a lot of work to be done in that. The life cycle analysis of the process is very important. As it was said, this is not a simple uh, system. And you have to think of the location of all these plants, you know, where do you do the recycling and so on uh, um, to really minimize the, uh, the energy and, and the, the green gas emissions of, for that process. The automation also is key uh, and um, as an example here, we have a, a very small scale uh, automated machine that will basically look at uh, staging a tape from, uh, from continuous uh, fiber placement process. So it is possible to automate the, automate the process, but there's still a lot of work to be done. So with this, I would like to acknowledge uh, the students that were involved with this, uh, this research. And uh, I'm opening the floor to any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pascal, for a very interesting talk. Um, so we do have uh, some questions. Um, so the first one is from Ivona uh, Temp Tempowski. Looking at the uh, piles of prepreg offcuts makes me think of quilting. Is there any inspiration to be gained from sewists? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, this is a, a great uh, question. Uh, I think, uh, well, if, if, we, if we look at the, um, the textile industry, I think they're also facing with, <laughs> with some sustainability issues. And, and so perhaps, yes, there will be some, some synergy there. 
I know there, there's some work uh, done on the more the recycling of dry fabrics and where you will then reclaim, well, you don't have the resin, so you only deal with fibers. And then obviously the, uh, there's a way to, to, uh, to, to take all these fibers and, 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 and uh, put them together and using the uh, same process as you make a wool, basically you end up with a fiber. Uh, but then trying to basically reassemble patches of material, uh, it's, it is complex, but it has been done. But again, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the wide range of shapes make it quite difficult to, uh, to do this, but certainly this is one route. Okay, thank you very much. So our second question comes from uh, an anonymous attendee. Yep. Uncured pre-preg offcuts would anyway require to be uh, appropriately preserved, characterized and C-staged. Are the associated costs justified by the performance and demand of the SMC part produced at the end? Is there enough volume of scrap material to sustain yeah. a reliable su industrial supply chain? Yeah, this is a, a great question uh, and I, I thank you for that. And this is something that we've, uh, we've been trying to quantify and it's often quite difficult uh, and there are, there are a company uh, doing uh, out there that are actually using the same approach to uh, to basically deal with with waste. So um, yes, it's it's uh, the 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 economic impact and all of that will have to be completely uh, studied to 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 justify this because often you know big uh, users of prepreg are not necessarily interested to use the material in, in their, uh, their scrap into their own product. So um, mm -hmm. it, it's not an easy question to, to answer, but obviously the economic has, uh, impact of that will have to be, uh, be studied. So, so I guess it's, it's something that uh, Richard Oldfield also touched on. It's yeah, exactly. be a balance between sort of regulation and market forces. And I guess if, if market forces can't sort, sort it, um, so, sort out the, the drive for greater recycling, it's gonna come down to regulation at the end. Well, uh, that's true for all, uh, I mean, it's, it's true for everything that has to do with recycling, recyclability and so on. I mean, right now it does not cost anything to, to dispose of this material, at least in the North America, maybe in Europe, uh, you're always a bit ahead of us in terms of, uh, of, of those issues so uh, one day it will have to be uh, you'll have to pay for <laughs> for that and uh, then but you need regulations for sure okay um another qu anonymous question my undergraduate uh degree was in uh, textiles um and masters in mechanical engineering can i apply my skills in composite sector well, of course, uh, composites are, are essentially a lot of the composite uh, com technology uh, comes from the textile industry. So there's a lot of uh, great applications for you, for sure. Okay. And then to upscale this technology, it's expected that the waste pieces of very different properties and compositions will come in at a large quantity how to classify such a large quantity and just use those giving you suitable viscosity properties. Okay. So I think this is um, sort of really looking at or asking about, I guess, when you've got a large mix of material properties. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this um, is what I- can, can, you can you guarantee that your waste will be sort of homogeneous or if not, how then do you um, guarantee that the, the, the sort of the pile of different bits and pieces you've got yeah. is, is suitable? Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, this is a, this is a, I don't have an answer for this. Uh, we haven't researched enough in that area. There's still a, a lot of unanswered question and that's one of them. It's like dealing with the variability that you have. Uh, so, uh, if you have different suppliers, different molders, they have all different kind of material systems, you know, do you have to tailor the, the solution for them or can you just mix different resins, different, yeah, this, this is still something we need to, to, to address. So even different chemistry, you have polyesters, you have epoxies, you have 
phenolics and so on. Um, yeah, there's still a lot of un unanswered questions. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I think that very much relates to the, the next question as well, yeah. which is asking about um, recycling different prefregs, yes. uh, thermoset and thermoplastic. So, of course, uh, thermoplastics are, are, can be a bit more straightforward to recycle, and we've, we've demonstrated that out. you don't necessarily even have to do much. You can just chop the material up and then remold it, and, and it works relatively well. Um, and there's also, you know, a lot of research on new resin systems that you can essentially depolymerize and reuse and so on. So there's, there's a lot of uh, very innovative solutions that are coming in terms of materials that are, are being re-engineered. But the problem is that a lot of the aerospace industry, they use resin chemistry from many years. They haven't changed much as it costs so much to certify new materials. So we have to find solution with these classic material as well. Yeah. So, so I think I'll, I'll just jump into the a question at the end on the, the Q&A, which is about um, uh, directly relates to that in terms of replacing some conventional resins like epoxies with polyurethane. Yeah. Is it a good way in terms of sustainability? Yeah, well, this, this is it. But again, uh, at the end of the day, it comes down, like if you think of certain industry, like the aerospace industry, which is heavily regulated, they, they have a very long process of qualifying materials. Uh, changing a material is, 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 is huge cost for them. And, uh, but then there's also the big push of the, uh, you know, the uh, urban mobility. There's a, you'll see a lot of these smaller companies that are popping up and they need uh, a lot of composites in their applications and that will require new resin systems. And so perhaps there's a, there's a window to introduce these next generation materials. And I know the big people like Excel, you know, Solvay and all of these guys, they work on these uh, more advanced resin systems, greener resin systems as well. So, uh, yeah, there's definitely some, some new technology that will come. So it's not going to happen, I think, in uh, in a year or two, as I think Richard showed as well. It's going to take many years to transition to uh, a more sustainable, but we have to find solutions today. Indeed. So, so with that, I think that brings us to, to the end of time. Uh, I'd like to thank um, uh, Pascal Hubert and Richard Oldfield. Uh, very much appreciate you coming um, to join us today and, and share your composite perspectives. I think it's been a, a, a very nicely balanced um, set of talks between the, the industrial pool and then some, some much lower TRL research, which doesn't yet have enough market pull. We, we've discussed some of the, the market forces and the economics, with, but um, I think without this low TRL uh, push from, from the uh, us academics, there's there, there's nothing in the in the pipeline that um, industry can pull on. So I think um, we've we've shown how there can there can be good balance to between um, industry and academia to um, to to answer to some of our our big sustainability challenges. So so thank you very much to to both of you, and thank you to our uh, over one hundred attendees. Um, Nice to see such a, a, a good attendance. And I will just uh, finish off by uh, noting that the uh, recording of this session will be available on the Bristol Composites Institute uh, YouTube channel. Um, there's a, a link in the chat. And also um, the next edition in our Composites Perspectives lecture series is on Monday the 12th of September, uh, later this year, at a slightly later time of 4 p.m. And that's going to have uh, Dr. Tia benson Toller from Boeing um, talking on composite circularity and recycling, uh, along with Professor Ian Hamilton from um, uh, the NCC and uh, Bristol Composites Institute talking about Hyperdiff, a new route to produce sustainable composites. So thank you everyone, buddy, for joining us and thanks again to our speakers.